Good morning, everyone. This morning, I'm going to do a talk called The Vision in the Heart. I think for this talk, you'll be nice and relaxed and at peace. Just feel, feel relaxed. Breathe out any tension. It's going to be a very relaxed talk. Hopefully it'll, it'll create that kind of atmosphere too. It's also going to be a sheer screen. So, start off with that. It's the vision in the heart. So I'm going to start off by mentioning a book that I came across many, many years ago. I think it's out of print now. It's a book entitled The Awakening Earth by Peter Russell. In this, he talks about a small nucleus of enlightened people, people who have themselves experienced the oneness of life. And this is the essential element for the initiation in the world of a permanent change for the better. Now the Mahachoan, who was the Theosophical Master's master, stated that rather perish the Theosophical Society with both its hapless founders, then we should permit it to become no better than an academy of magic and a hall of occultism, that we, the devoted followers of that spirit incarnate of absolute self-sacrifice, of philanthropy, divine kindness, as of all the highest virtues, attained along this earth of sorrow, the man of men, Gautama Buddha, should ever allow the Theosophical Society to represent the embodiment of selfishness, the refuge of the few, with no thought in them for the many, is a strange idea, my brothers. And my sisters, of course. Because of course, anyone who knows anything about the history of the Theosophical Society will be aware that the two masters who did the most work for it were avowed Buddhists, as were Blavatsky, H.P. Blavatsky and Colonel Olcott. Why is this? Because it was part of the Buddha's work to enlighten humanity and the idea evolved from his heart. The society was then and is carrying on this work, or it should be. All true vision evolves from the heart, the centre of spiritual consciousness. And the voice of the silence by H. P. Blavatsky says, the derma of the eye is the embodiment of the external and the non-existing. The derma of the heart is the embodiment of body the permanent and the everlasting. So the, the, the I is the intellectual study of something, just the dead letter, just reading the words, just taking in the facts and not um, getting to the essence where the heart is where is seeing behind the words, beyond the words. It's a spiritual awakening, a spiritual understanding of something. And Bodhi means wisdom. Now, when one really experiences the oneness of all things, then the whole of life changes. It's very easy to say this and to imagine that one has experienced oneness. But when one does, then all of our intellectual mindsets are annihilated because they are seen to be what they are, poor substitutes for the reality behind all things. Many people who experience oneness become silent and communicate through this silence, which is the highest form of communication. Ramana Maharishi says that silence is true eloquence. There's also a very similar saying by Thomas Carlyle, the philosopher, silence 
is more eloquent than words. So people realize that in silence can the true understanding be found. Others return to the world of forms and images and try to get across to others some flavor of their experience. But of course, this is almost impossible to do. The best that they can be hoped for is to inspire others to try for themselves, to purify their hearts and minds so that they can share in the experience and realize true brotherhood and sisterhood. Now, love is a word that is used ad nauseum sometimes in this context, but it is the best we have because all of our well-guarded orthodox views are shattered. Even when we are in love with another person, we cease to care what others think. We forget all our intellectual pride and are blissfully happy in the presence of our loved one. The difference between divine love and personal love is that personal love can pass and even become hatred or can bring a great deal of pain and suffering, whereas divine love is eternal and cannot pass once established in the consciousness of the individual. Once so entrenched, it gives only bliss to the aspirant. H.P. Blavatsky says in the Key to Theosophy, pure divine love is not merely the blossom of the human heart, but has its roots in eternity. It is this ocean of pure divine love that is praised by the poets, many of whom have been initiated into this particular experience. Evelyn Underhill, who wrote a lot on, on um, mysticism, describes them as initiates of a higher love. The master KH tells us that, that the true seer is always a poet. And this is because the true poet has the right constitution to open his or her heart to this overwhelming ocean of love that we live, move, and have our being in. In fact, he or she we are the only people who will ever experience this oneness and be able to use it effectively for the good of all. Love or harmony is the law of the universe and is all that exists in the final analysis. Of course, beyond that, we have non-existence, which is the only true existence, to use a paradox. It's beyond the range and reach of thought. Poets like the Sufi poet Rumi talk ceaselessly about love of the heart. In one of his poems, he says, the intellectual is always showing off. The lover is always getting lost. The intellectual runs away, afraid of drowning. The whole business of love is to drown in the sea. Intellectuals like to boast of having a clear apprehension of the teachings and being able to express them clearly and regard mystical thought as airy furry stuff in many cases. But the fact is that when one has a genuine experience of oneness, it is almost impossible to express it. And as said, usually it is communicated in silence or by the words and burring of he or she who has had the experience. In such a one, if a subject as mundane as the weather is discussed, the feeling comes across as something beyond words. In the case of the materialistic intellectual, even if they recite the whole of the secret doctrine or any spiritual scripture perfectly, there is still nothing of real value there. Mind you, I am not condemning the use of the intellect, which is essential on the path at a certain stage. It all depends upon what we read and how we read it. Do we read with the head or with the heart? Do we read things that are spiritually uplifting or books that give mere facts? 
ultimately, reading books does no good at all, unless it inspires us to change ourselves and to help others. I have always been one of the world's most avid readers, I must confess. But nowadays, I'm trying to be careful what I read and how I read it. Not very successful at times, I must admit. <laughs> Remember that even subjects like reincarnation and karma, rounds and races, etc., which we talk about in theosophy, are still materialistic concepts. They have nothing to do with the spirit, which is beyond the range and reach of thought. These subjects are connected to the sensible world and are therefore ultimately just more illusions in an illusory universe. But whilst we exist in this manifested universe, we need to take them into account for a while, whilst retaining an awareness of their transience. It is important to get these ideas focused in our minds and to teach them to beginners, but without ever thinking of them as anything more than signposts on the path. To understand spiritual things, we need to develop spiritual senses, if we can call them that. Only direct experience can bring the, the true understanding, if spirit can be understood in the way we think of understanding, it has to be experienced. Anyway, to return to this subject of love. Um, Plato says in the symposium, and this is Shelley's translation, Percy Bysshe Shelley. Love creates peace amongst all beings and divests us of all alienation from each other. It shows benignity upon the world and all harsh passions flee and perish in its presence. Love is the author of all soft affections, the destroyer of ungentle thoughts. It is our pilot, saviour, defence and guardian in times of hardship and trial. Love sings in the hearts of all living things and soothes the troubled minds of gods and men. Very beautiful words. Let's just relax a moment and let those words sink in. Now, Shelley's wife, Murray, also said of her famous husband, in his eyes, it was the essence of our being, and all war and pain arose from the war made against it by selfishness or insensibility or mistake. So love is the essence of our being. A more recent teacher, Eckhart Tolle, in his book, The Power of Now, discusses eloquently his experience of oneness after a period of depression. He says, I was awakened by the chirping of a bird outside the window. I had never heard such a sound before. My eyes were still closed and I saw the image of a precious diamond. Yes, if a diamond could make a sound, this is what it would be like. I opened my eyes. The first light of dawn was filtering through the curtains. Without any thought, I felt I knew that there was infinitely more to light than we realize. That soft luminosity filtering through the curtains was love itself. Tears came into my eyes. I got up and walked around the room. I recognized the room. And yet I knew that I had never truly seen it before. Everything was fresh and pristine.
So we can see clearly that whether we, there were Hindus, Buddhists, Christians, Muslims, Jews, pagans, or even agnostics, the experience of oneness is the same. That ultimate realization was identical, proving that in the final analysis, religion, names, etc., have no real value. As H.P. Blavatsky says in her book, Isis Unveiled, <clears throat> men and parties, sects and schools, are mere ephemera of the world's day. Truth, I seated upon its rock of adamant, is alone eternal and supreme. If we look upon theosophy intelligently and do not merely soak up the facts like a sponge, then we can see clearly that it teaches consistently this practical realization of the oneness of all things. The Bowen notes state that unless we keep this idea of oneness in our minds constantly, the teachings will lose their meaning and value. Well, I could spend the rest of the time quoting from, 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 um, from this book, but I won't. I'll just give one quote. This is from a book entitled The Path to Bodhidharma by Shodo Arada Roshi. He describes the experience of a man named Harishi who had become aware of the transitory nature. This is um, Shodo Harada Roshi. He described the experience of a man named Harishi, who had become aware of the transitory nature of all things and decided to meditate to realize the truth. Notice the similarities with the experience related by Eckhart Tolle. He says, at first light, hearing the sparrows chirping around outside the building, he found that body had completely disappeared. Suddenly, he saw his eyeballs pop from their sockets and fall to the ground. He felt the pain of his fingernails gouging into the palms of his hands and realized his eyes were back in their proper place. He arose from his cushion and began to walk about. He continued to practice in the same manner for three nights. On the third night, when daybreak came and he got up to wash his face, he noticed that the trees in the garden were now somehow totally different. He continued to meditate and began to feel that the sparrows were chirping in his own abdomen. Outside and inside became as one. Then, then on the third day of the second phase of his meditation, he awakes one morning and says, this is very funny, very strange. What's happening here? The whole garden is shining. The leaves are shining. I've never seen it look like this, this beautiful before. How weird. The trees are shining. The leaves are shining. Everything in the whole garden is shining. Even the rocks are shining. This is really interesting. I've never seen it look like this before. Arishi then sets off to see the sage Hakuin to have his experience authenticated. On his way, he comes to a spot on a hill where he can look across to Mount Fuji and also see the lake named Tagora. I'm not sure that's Tagora, it's just a lake near, near Fuji. He exclaims, I've passed through here many times before, but it's never looked like this. It was so beautiful and wonderful. It was as, as if he was seeing it for the first time. It is so beautiful, he continued. I've heard about this somewhere before, 
when the Buddha attained enlightenment, he said, how wondrous, how wondrous. All beings without exception are endowed from the origin with the same bright, clear mind to which I have just been awakened. How incredible. The trees, the birds, the grasses, they are all shining. Everything is full of this life energy. The true nature is illuminating and shining through everything. He then proceeded to find Hakuin. Hakuin, they're looking very happy. Who confirmed his experience as he also had had the same realization years before. But Arishi was an ordinary man with no prior knowledge of Zen and no real interest in mysticism. After a realization of the transitory, transitory nature of earthly life, he determined to break through to the truth and by sheer determination did so. This shows that although rules and regulations are given in books and are essential for most of us to have a safe and controlled unfoldment of consciousness, they are only guidelines and in reality, there are no rules and regulations and the truth can be realized in an instant if the conditions are right. And if the person is mentally, maybe they've been going through it for many lives. And this is the final one. There's a teaching that says that the advanced soul needs no rules or regulations and can do as they please. Their training has made it impossible to do anything that is against the purposes of nature. But there's a danger that someone who is catapulted into an experience of this oneness without this prior training, that they, that they may not have the same moral responsibility and therefore find themselves like a rudderless boat on the ocean of consciousness, unable to follow the constricting rules and regulations of society, but at the same time not focused enough upon the oneness of all things to act confidently in this realm of being. So it would, be, so it would seem, as H. P. Blavatsky says, that careful training is essential generally for the general run of people. But there are numerous exceptions even to this rule, as Harishi proves. Now, Kabir, a 15th century Indi Indian poet who blended Islamic and Hindu thought and transcended both, he says, do not go to the garden of flowers or friend, go not there. In your body is the garden of flowers. Take you a seat on the thousand petals of the lotus and their gaze on the infinite beauty. So there is something real that cannot be put into words, and we are all it. No external teacher is needed in the end, which may seem a paradox. But we are friends and guides. They are essential, but they come and go, and that is essential also. No clinging, a mind that moves on and the time is right. It does not matter if one travels the world or stays in one's living room. The journey is an inner one. We all find our own guides, real and imaginary. If the lesson is learned, what does it matter? What in the world is not an illusion that passes after a greater or lesser amount of time? H.P. Blavatsky again writes in an article entitled, Is the, the Desire to Live Selfish? Dis dis discussing the process of reaching enlightenment. She says, for that purpose, every veil of illusion, which creates a sense of separateness from the all, must be torn asunder. Or in other words, the aspirant must disregard all sense of selfishness with which we are all more or less affected. She said that this process may take many lifetimes, but this is a generalization. Also, there will be people who have been on the path for many lifetimes who need just a spiritual nudge to awaken them 
and who appear to reach an awakening with comparatively little effort. But in reality, they have probably struggled through many lives to reach that awakening. We need to look up from our books occasionally and be aware of what actually is going on. We need to be cognizant of the things, of these things, and not rooted in a mouldy past. I like, it, I like H. People have asked his expression to tear asunder these veils. It isn't so what she really knew, but not, could not give out at the time to a world too selfish and too much attached to objects of sense to be in any way prepared to receive such exalted ethics in the right path, in the right spirit, sorry. sorry. And this is from the foreword of the Voice of the Silence, which was dedicated to the few. But she must have been aware that as, that as time went on and more and more of the precious teachings of the East and West were translated by actual practitioners and not just Orientalists with no real feel for the inner meaning, that many of her teachings that remained in darkness when she was around would slowly be lightened by the experiences and wisdom of these people. Therefore, the teachings of H.P. Blavatsky that are coming forward now are the more practical ones, because this is what the world craves. It no longer needs the heavy theoretical concepts, but these have their place, of course. It needs to know what to do here and now to help end the pain that threatens to engulf humanity and to banish, and we need to banish, the great dire heresy of separateness that weans us from the rest, as I often say in my talks. The master KH, the Theosophical Master KH said, the greatest consolation in and the foremost duty in life is not to give pain and avoid causing suffering to man or beast. Those to me are very important words. We compliment ourselves on being cruel to be kind, on asserting ourselves at the expense of others, of complaining and all of these things that fall under the, under the heading of self, self-esteem. But the real esteem, esteem should be for the self with a capital S, the highest self, the imperishable triad, and for that dimension to our being that is shared by everyone, black or white, rich or poor, male or female, good or bad. The mistake that is made is that the esteem of the modern psychologist and therapist is often for the personal self. It is this worship of the physical that is the cause of most of the troubles in modern society. She said that the Atlanteans brought about their own destruction because they degenerated into worship of the physical and all that goes with it. Let us make sure that we do not go down the same road. On a recent train journey, as the sun was setting, I passed through many small towns and villages. I thought of all the people in all those houses, eating, drinking, sleeping, laughing, crying. I thought of the world in general. So many people manifesting on this shining globe, so many passing from it. Then a thought struck me. All of these beings are on their way to Buddhahood, all on a journey all on the same journey, while the same being wearing countless masks. I thought of the original mind, the pure mind that we all share, and somehow the beauty of it all was conveyed to me through the heart, the true spiritual centre, where all true vision arises. Everything that we do is in the sphere of the pure mind. Nothing really happens to us, individuality, only the personality suffers. There's a love at the heart of all things that will end our pain in time. There's never any cause to, to fear or to be broken hearted. Everything is helpful if we look at it rightly, if we have the true attitude, the true motive. Let us come together as true humans, because Confucius said that without fellow feeling or love, we are not human, but mere mannequins. And this may be very true. 
in the words of the Zen poet Ryokan, an evening dream. Everything must have been an illusion. I can't explain one part of what I saw, yet in my dream it seemed as if the truth were in front of my eyes. This morning awake, is it not the same dream? Was I a man dreaming as a butterfly? Or a butterfly dreaming I was a man? As Chuang Zi said, or Chuang Zhu. And of course, Edgar Allan Poe says, all that we see or seem is but a dream within a dream. Theosophy teaches that consciousness passes through many phases to gain experience. It moves through the elemental, mineral, plant and animal kingdoms. And when we reach the human stage, we develop self-consciousness. And then as the secret doctrine by H.P. Lovatsky tells us, we can proceed by self-induced and self-devised efforts or methods. In other words, we can take our own spiritual progress in hand and find our own ways to realize the truth. We are all different and all need to discover what helps, helps us to reach our Holy Grail. We all have our own path, our own way. As the monks say, the Zen monks say, a thousand monks, a thousand ways. We are all different and need to discover what helps us to reach our own particular Holy Grail. Animals are said to be conscious, but not self-conscious. I'm aware that many teachings exist that contradict this. But this is the theosophical teaching, and therefore can be demonstrated logically by the fact that the physical vehicle that we have and the modes of communication, etc., demonstrate a refinement of a vehicle to express more and more of the spirit within. As humans, we can appreciate subjects of a spiritual nature and all the higher aspects of art, music, poetry. We can also express our emotions and feelings with more refinement than animals can. Though the rudiments of these feelings can be seen in the animal, especially in the domesticated variety. One more proof of this unfoldment of consciousness. I'm aware sometimes during a beautiful weather or beautiful summer of how nature unfolds harmoniously. Beneath humanity are the kingdoms of elementals, minerals, plants and animals. And we know from our walks in the countryside that harmony prevails there. Above us, in a sense of above, <laughs> we have the holy men, angels, Jian Chuans, the log Logai. And in our meditations, we can sense their peace and beneficence. Man is the centre of this vast scheme. And he is at the point where free will comes into operation. So in the materialistic world, he's often like a blot on the landscape, obscuring the spirit like a piece of wood followed into a stream, obstructing the flow. Only when we realise our oneness with all things and harmonise our natures will the river of life flow through us and the whole of nature will breathe a sigh of relief. This we need to do individually and collectively. Remember, that ultimately, there is only one consciousness that manifests through a series of vehicles of increasing complexity. All differences are in the end just illusory. There's only one being in the universe. As I've said before, this is one being is, is wearing countless masks. Practically, this means that we need to try to understand everyone, not be selective and just try to associate with those of our own class or who we feel physically attracted to. The physical here includes the lower mind and emotions. We need to see beyond the mass to the real man or the true woman. This is how we learn. Never judge by appearances one way or the other. Learn to develop the intuitions. True love needs to be unconditional and harder work is needed to understand those who outwardly repel you. 
but the work needs to be done or Kerma will bring about the balance in time. It is easy to, easy to talk about love, but hard to bring it into our lives as a practical living reality. The poet Nazir writes, when the eye of wisdom opened in me, all duality and unity disappeared. A great wonder possessed my soul, neither subject nor object remained. When the music of reality fell on mine ear, all the sounds ceased. Love withdrew all name and form from my being. Sorrow and joy vanished forever. These people have actually in the masters have said that we should preach and promulgate a knowledge of theosophy and particularly the doctrines of reincarnation and karma or hope and responsibility. Reincarnation gives us hope because it teaches us that there's always a chance to redeem ourselves and put things right. It also fits us squarely as human beings into the laws of nature that we see around us day and night, waking and sleeping, the seasons, Instead of being freaks of nature, as materialistic thought would have us believe, we are in fact part and parcel of nature's process and as much the product of nature as a tree. Karma teaches us responsibility as it proves to us that we cannot escape the consequences of our actions. There are teachings needed in society. Let's make sure that we spread them. But in doing so, we need to emphasize the naturalness of the spiritual path. It is not weird as some organisations and individuals would have us believe. It is all as natural as breathing. Just a case of awakening and acting naturally instead of like automatons controlled by the media, education system, politicians, scientists, religious leaders, etc. The trouble is that our cities and office jobs have so alienated us from nature that we lose sight of this naturalness. Let's just return to the natural, the beauties of nature. I read somewhere, I think it was from B.P. Wadier, an uh, early theosophist, that in a golden age, every man and woman will live in tune with their higher, na higher self and each will follow their own way. There'll be no need for outer rules and regulations. Far from being chaotic, we will all be linked by one aspiration, which will be to attune ourselves to the divine. And this will bring us together rather than separate. But organizations like police forces, armies and governments, which a degraded society has made necessary, will not be needed as they are based upon force and coercion generally. Well, nowadays they are anyway. Leo Tolstoy has said that government is violence. I tend to agree, but what would we do without them at the moment? We have, we, society has created its Frankenstein's monster, which threatens to turn round and rend it to pieces. We, meaning all those who are capable of an unselfish impulse, must try to keep our spirits high and cultivate unconditional love and always be optimistic because we are all one and whatever we do affects the whole human race and indeed all living things. So we need to keep the spiritual flag flying and be sure that the light does not go out during this Kali Yuga or age of darkness. The responsibility given to us is a great one, but also a beautiful one, if looked at correctly. I know that it is difficult at times to know how to respond to those who are going through hard times. We can all use our intuitions and try to do our best. The impetus is always to try to ease the pain of others. If karma is against us, there's nothing that we, can, we will do that will prevent the workings of that karma. But we need to try. 
H.P. Levatsky said in one of her articles that it is sometimes better to leave those in poverty where they are, as they have lessons to learn and will be worse off if taken out of that environment and placed in another. But we as individuals need to try to develop the wisdom that will give us the intuition to know what to do. She also said that if we are not prepared to share our last morsel with those weaker and poorer than ourselves and help our brothers and sisters, regardless of race, creed, sex, caste or colour, then we are not theosophists. Of course, the word theosophy does not just refer to someone belonging to any organisation, but to all who follow the path of divine wisdom for the good of all. Now to quote Eva Gorbu, a poet. <clears throat> for years I sought the many in the one. I thought to find lost waves and broken rays. The rainbow's faded colours in the sun, the dawns and twilights of forgotten days. But now I seek the one in every form, scorning no vision that a dewdrop holds the gentle light that shines behind the storm, the dream that many a twilight hour enfolds. I think we should take out that it, it, take to heart this very happy note, that we are our own saviors and that love and light and healing proceed from our very own hearts. We are one with each other and all the kingdoms of nature and we can learn from everything under the sun. But ultimately, the final answer lies within each one of us individually and collectively. We're not helpless upon this shining globe, traversing the fields of space and time, and there are positive ways in which we can help all the masters and all, all spiritual beings to bring about a golden age of light and of love. Let us as students and practitioners of theosophy and spirituality in general stand shoulder to shoulder in that quest and we will receive the help that we need to work wonders in the world. Motive is everything in this case, as it always is and will be. The vision in the heart is a crystal clear one. It is something that everyone can access. It is wonderful that we have such a legacy left to us by so many spiritual heroes throughout the ages, many of them giving their lifeblood so that we would have signposts and not become lost on the misty road to the heart of the universe. We all know that H.P. Blavatsky was one of these, but there are countless others, many known to us and still more not. In all of this, we can see the influence of the silent watcher who supervises the welfare of this planet or the manifestation of this silent watcher, each one of us as our higher self. Our Lord, our witness, our resting place, our asylum and our friend, as the Bhagavad Gita says it. Let us try to make the beautiful power of that inner self active in our daily lives, no matter what we are doing. Let's not complain of circumstances. We are where we must be. We can feel the calm peace of our true selves in the midst of all the cacophony, if we try. We all have it in our power to live the oneness that we are so fond of talking about and to therefore make the brotherhood of all things a living reality in our lives. It just means we need to think more of others and to work for others, no matter where they are. H.P. Lovatsky said that we should think more of mutual culture and self-culture, and that's good advice. In the words of Matthew Arnold, another poet, where we see a shining universe. Before I say the poem, we'll just dwell on this for a few moments.
in the words of in the words of Matthew Arnold, which is a fine prayer to our higher self to help, to help us to bring these things I've talked about into being. He says, "Calm soul of all things, make it mine to feel amid the city's jar that there abides a peace of thine, man did not make, and cannot mar." The will to neither strive nor cry, the power to feel with others give. Calm, calm me more, nor let me die before I have begun to live. I pray to my inner self that we can all come together on this planet in love and peace and that all wars will cease inwardly and outwardly so that we can sense and feel the beauty and depth in the hearts of all our fellow human beings regardless of race, creed, sex, caste and colour and that we can begin to see with the eye of love. And seeing with this eye, we can understand that the eyes are not just the windows of the soul, but also stairways to heaven. Om Shanti, 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 peace. Peace, peace. Thank you very much for listening. Have a great day and a great life. I hope you can we can all learn to see with this vision of the heart and can bring peace, love and harmony to this troubled world. Thank you.